I am indeed privileged and honored to introduce Dr. Kiran Mujumdar Shah. The face of women entrepreneur in India is Dr. Kiran Mujumdar Shah. Not only a women entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur promoting the cause of women, not necessarily in terms of entrepreneurship, but recognizing their immense contribution to the development of nation, development of society, and development of homes, which is often neglected. A successful technocrat of global standing, Mrs. Shaw heads the leading biotechnology enterprise, Biocon, and I was just informed that it is the, having the third largest market cap as of today. She is highly respected in the corporate world and has been recently voted by Nature Biotechnology as the most influential in bio business person outside Europe and USA. She has received honorary doctorate of science from Balarat University in recognition of her preeminent contribution to the field of biotechnology. She also has been awarded honorary doctorates from University of Alberti, Dundee, UK, University of Glasgow, UK, and Harriet Watt University, Edinburgh. Mrs. Shaw chairs Karnataka's Vision Group on Biotechnology and also served on the Board of Science Foundation, Ireland. She presently serves on the Advisory Council of Government's Department of Biotechnology where she has been instrumental in bringing government, industry and academia together to chart a clear and progressive growth path for biotechnology in India. Most recently, she has been invited to join Prime Minister's Council on Trade and Industry in India and the US-India CEO Forum. Mrs. Shaw is the recipient of several prestigious awards including Economic Times Business Women of the Year, Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Life Sciences and Healthcare, Technology Pioneer, many, among many others. Her most cherished awards are the National Awards Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan in 1989 and 2005 respectively presented to her by the President of India for her pioneering efforts in industrial biotechnology. Under her stewardship, Biocan has evolved from its inception in 1978 as an industrial enzyme company to a fully integrated biopharmaceutical enterprise encompassing a well-balanced business portfolio of products and services with a research focus on diabetes, oncology, autoimmune disease. During this transition, Biocas has established two subsidiaries, Sinjin in 1994, to provide development support services for discovery research and ClinGen in 2000 to cater to services in clinical development. Recently, she has been conferred with the Australia's highest civilian honor, the Order of Australia for a significant service towards advancing Australia's bilateral relationship with India. We could not have got a better person to inaugurate this conclave on leadership, I offer you Dr. Kiran Mujumdar Shah. Thank you for your rather generous introduction, Professor Pandit. Thank you very much. And of course, it's a pleasure to share the dais with the doyen of this institute, Professor Sharma. It's great to see Professor Yadav, many other friends in the audience, uh, you know, Nitin, Vikas, Anurag, Cyrus, many, many uh, friends. Kavita, I see, has just walked in. So I just think this is a wonderful, uh, you know, event for me to really deliver this keynote address because I realize that, you know, first and foremost, uh, we are starting on this, uh, um, you know, this very interesting and important topic of how do we develop affordable, 
biologics, affordable biosimilars, how do we continue the success that we have had with uh, generic molecules with now biologic molecules. So, you know, I'm speaking to an audience that obviously is very, very familiar with science and technology and I thought, let me also bring in the business perspective, the, the burden of disease perspective and the opportunity perspective for all of us to address, not just as mature industries, but as startups, as scientists, as uh, you know, bioprocessors, and of course as academicians who are training the talent pool to get us there. So I think this is a very important subject. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. So, you know, let's first celebrate the fact that over the past decades, India has very rightfully earned the title of becoming the pharmacy of the world. Because as you know, um, this and many other institutes like ICT have actually played a phenomenal role in developing the expertise required, the capabilities required to produce medicines using synthetic chemistry and chemical synthesis. And these, as you know, are often referred to as small molecules. Um, a good example is, of course, uh, Lipitor or Atorvastatin, which, as many of you know, is a cholesterol-reducing drug. Uh, it is comprised of 76 atoms and has a molecular weight of about 559 Daltons. That's to give you the perspective of the size of the molecules that we're talking about. And as you know, these generic molecules have played a significant role in reducing the disease burden bo in, in, in both chronic and infectious diseases. And I think here, uh, you know, what we've seen is that we've very carefully understood the chemical imbalances in our bodies. We've actually developed drugs that treat these chemical imbalances. And this has become the standard of care in the medical world for decades. And now, fast forward what has, is happening today, the advent of biologics. I think with the discovery of genes, with the discovery of DNA, and of course with Herb Boyer's first recombinant protein that was discovered in the 70s, I think this became the path forward for really developing a new class of drugs, biologics, protein therapeutics, whatever you might call it, or large molecules at it, as it is commonly referred to. This actually created a very different path of research pursuit. What do we need to know about the biological processes. How do we understand human biology and how do we understand what malfunctions of human biology do in terms of triggering disease? I think that became a very, very important phase in our whole approach to understanding disease, understanding, uh, you know, uh, the development of new entities to fight disease. And both a few companies, Genentech, Amgen, and a few others became the early pharmaceutical or biopharmaceutical companies to start really shifting the focus from chemical synthesis to bioprocessing. And this is what I think, as I call it, the advent of biologics, when in the late 70s, you know, the insulin gene, the insulin producing gene was actually inserted uh, into a microbe and that became the first recombinant DNA product. But I think what was very important is actually the advent or the production of epogen. I think Professor Sharma mentioned about erythropoietin. And the genetically engineered manufacturing and a process development of erythropoietin really heralded this whole space of biologics. 
following that came another huge area of understanding which was immuno oncology for long i think the whole uh, cancer challenge was being fought with chemotherapy radio radiotherapy and of course surgical interventions it's often called slice poison and burn that's the term that is used for you know conventionally treating cancer and that never really gave, you know gave us the opportunity to completely fight that battle and then came immuno oncology where it was clearly recognized that it was the malfunction of the immune system that actually triggers the onset of cancer and the deeper we go into the subject which is a very complex subject the better we understand how to deal with cancer and so today what we are doing is we are leading we are developing a number of what we call targeted therapies where we understand which aspect of the immune system is really causing the cancer and by developing these antibodies that are targeting these particular malfunctions we are able to actually counter cancer in a much more effective way and what we are doing basically in every one of these biologic opportunities is to mimic the way the body fights disease to mimic biologically how the body reboots its immune system to cure cancer and therefore we believe that the paradigm of cancer treatment is shifting from cancer care to cancer cure today we know that we have a number of therapies that are actually able to reverse cancer to get rid of cancer we have many examples as we know bone marrow transplant itself was an excellent example of how we understand how the human body has to deal with certain kinds of blood cancers and we know that today the car t's and the whole area of cell therapy is proving to be another very big opportunity for a country like india but all of this is a very expensive business is a very expensive process let's look at the challenge and 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 let's look at the challenge that we are facing these large molecules are complex molecules but these complex molecules actually help us to battle disease much more effectively than their chemical counterparts Let's start with breast cancer. About 1.6 million women worldwide each year are diagnosed with breast cancer, and one in five of these women will have what we call as HER2 positive breast cancer. And this is a particularly aggressive form of the disease, which in the past was untreatable, unaddressable. today thanks to the discovery of this monoclonal antibody trastuzumab that binds specifically with her2 protein 85% of these women are expected to survive for at least 10 years more if not more if not greater and this is a spectacular reversal of the survival outcome for these patients who otherwise had a death sentence served on them trastuzumab in comparison to the earlier molecule that i talked about has 20000 atoms and 185000 daltons so if you remember it was 559 daltons compare that to this this is the size that we are trying to deal with this is the complexity that we are trying to deal with and it's interesting to note that trastuzumab entered clinical development in 1992 and was approved in 1998 initially for the treatment of her2 positive metastatic breast cancer and later it was also found to be effective in 20% of gastric cancers whose tum whose tumors are her2 positive today there are a wave of such monoclonal antibodies for a range of cancers peg filgrastim or filgrastim to fight neutropenia bevacizumab a vegf antibody to fight again a number of cancers including breast cancer 
And I think what we are seeing is that there is now an explosion of immuno-oncology products for just not cancer but many, many autoimmune diseases because as we understand the immune system, we are actually finding new answers to fighting many, many diseases. And I can certainly tell you that these targeted therapies have absolutely transformed the way we look at disease and treat disease. It is said that by 2025, 70% of new drug approvals are predicted to be biologics. That is the research explosion we are seeing. And that is the huge paradigm shift we are seeing in the pharmaceutical industry. So, while biological agents are playing an increasingly important role in disease, it is also giving us a huge financial challenge in terms of healthcare costs. So, in 2017, Biologic drugs represented 2% of all U.S. prescriptions, but 37% of net drug spending. This is untenable, not just for India, but for any developed part of the world, including the U.S. You cannot have 2% of the prescriptions commanding 37% of your drug spending bill. It's not tenable. And we also know that since 2014, drug, you know, these biologic drugs accounted in terms of the growth of, of pharmaceutical products, it actually occupied 93% of that growth in pharmaceutical spending. So these are the challenges we are talking about. The top 10 most lucrative drugs in 2018 were approximately worth $87 billion and eight of them were biologics. So 80% of our top 10 drugs are biologics and they account for $87 billion. And this is the big challenge we have to address across the globe, not just in India. India, of course, is, is something we've all known, that these kind of drugs are just beyond the reach of most patients. Even the most affluent of patients will not be able to afford the kind of price points that are being commanded in the developed world. Now, what is the opportunity? Many of these biologic drugs that have been developed over the past few decades are now losing patent protection and of course they provide a huge opportunity for, for us in India to develop biosimilars. And why do we need to do this? Because we do need to bring down the cost of these biologics just, and we've done it for generic drugs and why can't we do it for biologic drugs is the question. And what is also very obvious is that the penetration of biosimilars that have been developed in the last decade is proving to be very encouraging. In emerging markets, the penetration has been extremely rapid. And we also know that in Europe, biosimilars have made a huge difference to healthcare spends. And now it's very interesting to see the quick adoption of biosimilars in the US as well. This was a lot, there was a lot of skepticism about uptake and adoption of biosimilars, especially in the US, but this is being proved wrong because I think everyone is conscious of bringing down healthcare costs. And therefore, what is being suggested and what is the compelling reason for this adoption of biosimilars is the fact that it has been predicted that the spending on biologics can be reduced as much as $54 billion by 2026 if you adopt biosimilars. And this is why all healthcare systems are racing towards adopting biosimilars. Governments and regulatory agencies have recognized the role of biosimilars, as I mentioned, and we all know that these are very attractive markets 
What is interesting is that Europe, perhaps as, an, as a developed market, is the largest market for biosimilars. 50 products have been approved in, in, in Europe. But what is also important is that the US is also now catching up with, the U, uh, with Europe, showing the demand and need for biosimilars. Now, with all these opportunities, why are we as a country not really taking advantage of these opening opportunities. I think I really want to focus a little few minutes on this slide. Developing biologics or biosimilars is a very complex and expensive and time-consuming process. I think all of us have got very used to the fact that developing a generic molecule takes a very short time. It doesn't take huge deep pockets to invest in developing a single generic molecule. And we know from general metrics that we all talk about that it takes less than a few years. You can develop a ANDA in a couple of years. You can spend less than, a, you know, maybe less than five million for sure. It actually takes you about one or two million dollars. And the process and the path is extremely abbreviated. You need to do BEBA study and that's it. And you're in, you get approval and when the patent expires, you're in the market. But that's not the path for biosimilars, bio unfortunately. Biosimilars bio is an many orders of magnitude higher than what it takes for chemically synthesized genetics. You know, the whole development, the discovery cycle or the development cycle is a very long drawn out process. And then it's made much more complex by the fact that the comparative criteria for developing biosimilars demands huge investment in instruments, in, 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 in uh, the lab infrastructure, uh, the uh, bioprocessing infrastructure, and then of course, you can see that the time taken to develop a single molecule takes as long as four to six years. And this is considered to be the shortest path, by the way. It takes closer to nine to 10 years because very often you have to do extensive clinical trials, which also take a very long time. The cost of developing clinical trials is huge because again, the reference cost is of, of, of the, pro, the cost of the reference product is also adding to that cost, which is a very expensive cost. I want you all to re realize that it's not an easy task to develop a biosimilar. Yes, many countries have got abbreviated paths. I think we ourselves in India, because of the need for developing affordable access to such important life-saving biologics, we worked with the regulators and made sure that we focused on safety, efficacy, and immunogenicity, but we did see how with that in mind, can you reduce the drug development cost, the drug development pathway? And I must say, we came out with a fairly justified uh, you know, risk reduction approach to uh, coming out with guidelines for biosimilars that makes it cheaper for companies in India to develop biosimilars. Hopefully, over the years, this scientific approach to drug development when it comes to biologics will be adopted by other regulators around the world. And hopefully, the cost of such development will come down. For example, I know that we spent a lot of money developing biosimilar insulins for the world, for, for developed markets. And I know that at long last, by having repeated discussions with uh, various agencies, the European agency, the US FDA, they've actually come to a point where they're willing to waive phase three trials. And really depending on very high-end PKPD data from phase one trials. So I think there's a huge amount of progress being made in this area. And I'm sure that over the years, there will probably be much shorter or smaller phase three trials than is being prescribed today. 
who knows they may like for ANDAs they might waive phase 3 trials in the future but still I must caution you that phase 1 trials when it comes to these kind of clinical trials is going to be very expensive. It is not as cheap as developing a, a synthetically um, a produced drug, chemically synthesized drug. So these are the real challenges we are talking about in terms of drug development, but then that's the opportunity to innovate. I think that's where India must innovate. How do we basically, you know, take this opportunity that is emerging in terms of biosimilars, how, we de how do we develop new approaches, new technologies upstream and downstream in terms of bioprocessing? How do we get super producing clones? How do we get the clone development process to be accelerated? How do we develop expertise to make sure that all the product characterization is done in a very, very expeditious and accurate way. I think we also are a country that is that that boasts about our data analytic skills, that boasts about our IT skills, our software skills, and you know that many of these technologies can be now combined with uh, you know biological sciences to make this whole journey much more predictable and precision oriented. So I think there is a lot to be done and we must take advantage of this. I know that as a company we are investing huge amounts in terms of you know building a digital backbone to our research, to our manufacturing and when you talk about digital backbones you are talking about digital a digital backbone that leads to automation, that leads to predictability, that leads to uh, consistency in terms of product quality and so on and so forth. And you cannot do it without technology. So I think this is a time for all of us and I would particularly like ICT to focus on this whole area of data science related to biological sciences. I think bio-IT is going to be a very, very important part of our journey ahead. So I think we need to work with the regulatory agencies in our country to see how we further strengthen our track record as a quality producer, a high quality producer of biologics because there's always these questions and concerns around are we taking shortcuts, are we not doing enough, are we you know, not focusing on product characterization in a deeper way and all of these questions can be answered. You need data to counter it and I think a lot of Indian companies are investing huge amounts to make sure that we are you know, on par with all the companies that are developing biosimilars for global market. Now, as a company, I would like to take pride in saying that Biocon was one of the front runners in, when it came to biosimilars globally. I still remember when we embarked on this path of developing biosimilars, there were lots of skepticism. There was a lot of questions asked to me also because very few companies in the world were actually betting on biosimilars and everyone started asking me why are you betting on biosimilars aren't you taking a big risk even the paths are not clear us fda has not even announced a regulatory path for biosimilars europe is gingerly announcing paths for biosimilars india has some path for biosimilar but is it credible why are you making such huge investments and we were making big investments, okay? And I said, to me it's obvious. The next big opportunity, the big bolus of growth that is going to come in the pharmaceutical industry globally is going to come from biosimilars or biogenerics, whatever you want to call them. And I'm willing to, you know, make those investments right now. I want to be one of the front runners. I want to be one of those early movers even though it's going to be expensive because that's our business. We are a biotech company. I don't want to be a me too when we've got into biopharmaceuticals saying, okay, let me copy what everybody else is doing. I want to lead the way. We want to pioneer. We want to be path breakers in biosimilars. And I can tell you, I got a lot of brickbacks from the capital markets, from many of my shareholders saying I'm wasting money. Because, you know, these were very expensive bets. R&D was huge compared to anything else other companies were doing. We had to spend almost 15% of our revenues on R&D. 
And that is something nobody liked in India. But I stuck to it. I said, listen, if you don't like my story, if you don't like my business approach, please don't invest in Biocon. So much so that my own colleague said, don't say such things. But I said, no, I want people to invest in R&D. I want in people to start taking the risk with me. We have to take that risk together. And I want every one of us in this room to understand that unless we are prepared to take those big bets, make those big bets, take those big risks, we will never be a leader in what we want to do. So we've got to do that. And that's what I really truly believe in. And as a result of taking that big bet, taking those bold risks, and you know, it's very funny, uh, you know, uh, you sp uh, uh, Padma, you spoke, spoke about, you know, women now leading the way. And I remember there was this huge sort of myth that women are not risk takers. That is even today perceived like that. Because when you go to a VC, they keep saying women are not ambitious. Women are not risk takers. I said, listen, I think that's a big myth. I think bust I busted some of those myths. <laughs> Of course, I didn't do it alone. I had this great team of men working with me as well. <laughs> so, I just want to say in, on a more serious note that, you know, we've now got 15 years plus of very rich experience of developing biologics and biosimilars. You know, Professor Sharma, you mentioned that there is no no, NCE that has come out of India. I'm very proud that Biocon has brought two novel biologics to the Indian market, but with very little support from the medical community. <laughs> we don't believe in our own science. We don't believe in our own success. We don't believe that we can actually develop world-class drugs. Unfortunately, I've had to license one of those drugs to a US company to build credibility for a molecule that I believe is world class, first in class, and something that can make a huge difference to many unmet medical needs. But that's us. We have to build credibility for ourselves. And I think ICT has built a lot of credibility for our capabilities. You know, I must congratulate ICT because you've played such a nation-building role for the pharmaceutical industry and we must give them a big applause. I also want to tell you that as a company, we have invested over a billion dollars to get to where we are today. We have invested those billion dollars in research and development, in creating global scale manufacturing, and of course, you know, you know, developing talent with which to actually, you know, get into global markets. So it's been a very expensive journey, no doubt, but I think we are now seeing the payback. After all, we are very proud that we were the first company uh, to receive approval for the first biosimilar pegfil grastim and the first biosimilar trastuzumab in none other than the US of A. That was a big, big endorsement for what we've done. <laughs> and we crossed the finishing line with really, really tough and big competitors, including some of the names you took, sir, ab about you know, the Korean companies who were also trying to do the same, but the small company out of India managed to do it. And the reason we managed to do it, I must tell you, is because there was this absolute focus, commitment, and attention to detail. We wanted to make sure that we actually came across as a very high quality, credible company and that we had done everything systematically. In fact, because we were doing all this with such a focus, you know, laser sharp focus, I can tell you that we really thought we wouldn't be the first because we didn't want to overlook any aspect of getting that approval. So we thought we will be the third or fourth company to get approval in the market because there were such big companies, you know, ahead of us. 
Pfizer, Amgen, all these companies were ahead of us. And we thought, oh, we may probably be the third or fourth company. But lo and behold, the others got sent back saying, you haven't given us enough data. And our first submission got us across the line. So again, I want to tell everyone in the audience and ICT particularly, we must have good processes and systems so that we actually do it correctly, we do it well, and we get it right the first time. I think that's extremely important. I think in this country, we do have this shortcut op uh, you know, approach to things. We should not take shortcuts. Please, this is one appeal I make to everyone, especially students who are in this audience. You've got to be thorough. You've got to be exhaustive. You've got to be very, very committed to doing things right and making sure that you're, you've covered all the systems and processes that need to get you to where you want to go. So I think that's extremely important. And it teaches you a lot. I mean, today, let me tell you, because of the way we've done it, now our ex confidence and, and, and uh, you know, this in, in capabilities is so high that we know that we can now churn out more and more biosimilars in a shorter way because we now understand the science behind it. When this subject of biosimilars is about scientific understanding, it's about depth of scientific understanding. The kind of analysis you do, the kind of characterization you do, the kind of methods that you develop is all about deep science. It's about understanding that science. And I think that is what is going to make us as a country successful in developing biosimilars. Today, I'm pleased to inform you that we have 28 molecules either in the market or in development. That's the pipeline we have created. You can understand if it takes you $200 million a piece to develop these kind of biosimilars, how expensive that bet is going to be. But we've also played it in a very intelligent way. We did realize that these were expensive programs, expensive products, and a company like Biocon on its own would find it very difficult to bring all these molecules to the market. So we have forged very important partnerships to make sure that we share the cost and the risk and then have a profit share in terms of getting into those markets. So I think we've done a very interesting mapping of what that model should be, how many of them can we really take on our own, how many of them should be partnered. And so I think it's been a very good exercise for all of us in terms of strategy. And I think ICT can be a very valuable partner in terms of developing biosimilars up to a point and licensing it out to a number of companies. That's a th uh, you know, one of the opportunities you have. And it's not just about startups, but it's about doing something in a very interesting way for ICT to generate a lot of royalty from the kind of uh, programs, processes that you will be developing as an organization. So I, I strongly urge you to think about that. Another, uh, you know, since I'm on startups, I also want to mention to you that the biggest challenge we have in this country for startups is endurance. Startups have benefited greatly from government-backed seed funding and risk capital. And I must congratulate BIRAC in a big way for actually supporting the biotech sector because they've played a humongous role in, in, in you know, generating the number of biotech startups in this country as we have because every one of those startups have benefited from BIRAC. But the challenge is you got from concept to proof of concept. The biggest challenge now we have is how do you go from proof of concept to the market? And that takes a huge amount of investment, especially in these kind of areas. How are we going to bridge that gap? Because VCs are lazy. They are so spoiled by the IT sector that have very short market avenues with much lower investment levels and much higher market caps when they want to exit because these are simple, smart technologies, aggregator technologies. It doesn't cost you very much. So why should you invest those big dollars into a gestational business that is going to take you years 
and then of course there's price control and there is all con all economies are trying to bring down the cost of drugs so why would you want to invest in that sector that's the real challenge we have but i do believe that despite all that i think india can be a big leader in biosimilars and i think you know institutes like ict must must stake you know put their stake in the ground when it comes to uh, you know playing that important role you've played such an important role in developing the talent for the pharmaceutical industry and for the biopharmaceutical industry now you have to actually do a little more of forward integration go to the level where you can actually develop a ready to go into the clinic kind of model you don't have to do the clinical trial but you can develop a product where you've done all the various requirements of developing a biosimilar shaping a biosimilar characterizing a biosimilar and saying okay now you guys if you want this drug license it from us you take it into the preclinical stage you take it into the clinical stage and we'll sit back and earn some royalties of this and develop even more products so that's something which i really urge you to do so as far as biocon is concerned um you know we have so far commercialized five biosimilars uh in in the uh, key uh, developed markets and these are of course trastuzumab pegfilgrastim we've also got bevacizumab uh recombinant human insulin and rec and insulin glargine uh, in many many global markets so i think this is something that we are just adding to we also have another insulin analog shortly to enter the clinic and so on and so forth so if you look at what we have done in a very short time and we are very close to launching even more products this slide should actually start getting populated with at least another five uh, products in the next year or two so i think that's the pace at which now we are growing as you rightly said it's tough to get to the first molecule but thereafter you start speeding up so now let me come to my very exciting um, program of uh the mission 10 cents that we have embarked on why did we do this first and foremost i want to share with you uh professor pandit and professor sharma that that when we got into biopharmaceuticals what actually got me into biopharmaceuticals was the fact that there was this very exciting opportunity to develop recombinant human insulin a product that india was importing from europe and from the us at a price point which most diabetics could not afford and most diabetics were using animal insulins because that's what they could afford right and i said to myself look we are a biotech company we have got recombinant dna technologies that we have developed from enzymes and what are enzymes enzymes are nothing but proteins right so why should i be why can't i be agnostic to what i'm making and just look use the technology for something else and that something else became insulin for us and we are the only company in the world that produces insulin using pikia technology because pikia technology was my most successful recombinant dna technology which i used to make some enzymes with I used to make phytase enzymes with that and i said why not use that for insulin so we started developing this technology and it worked the high yielding uh, clone i had of pikia and we developed the technology and today we are the only, even though we are a me too we are not a me too when it comes to the technology i have a lot of patents we have a huge armory of patents when it comes to our insulin production capabilities and that is why most companies have these problems fighting process patents with some of the innovators we don't because we have very different uh, you know processes so that also differentiated us in a big way we are very proud that we are the lowest cost producer of insulin in the world we also therefore believe that we can deliver insulin at 10 cents a day because this is a global pandemic with lots of people not having insulin uh, not having access to this life saving medicine called insulin we are approaching the 100th anniversary of 
the discovery of insulin, okay, by Banting and Best. And yet, insulin continues to be a very high-priced product in most parts of the world. In US, it's a scandal because they are charging a price that most people cannot afford. In fact, it's become like a national scandal. Every congressman and senator is only talking about the insulin pricing in the US. And we are there to disrupt it. That's what we want to do now. And therefore, I believe that, and, and 10 cents to me is a, not only a doable proposition, but we are doing it already. So we are very, very uh, excited with this, uh, you know, global commitment to diabetics around the world. And by the way, at 10 cents a day, it is a profitable proposition for us because we are in India, because the cost of manufacturing in India is where it is. It is very competitive. And moreover, our technology is very strong and robust that we believe we can really compete with anyone in the world. So this has become a very important mission for us. And I really look forward to, you know, making this into a global success, just like we did with the HIV epidemic, where India has played such an important role in really, you know, making a big difference to HIV AIDS patients around the world. We want to do the same with diabetes. Of course, we also want to do the same with cancer and others, but this is going to be a very important mission for us. So I just want to also say that, you know, we really believe that we want to make a difference to patients' lives. I always tell my colleagues in Biocon and the Biocon group, our business is about making a difference to patients. Our business is about making a difference to healthcare costs. Our mission and our business is about really making the healthcare system across the world far more accessible. If that's our business, then patients are the ones that come into focus. Patients are at the core of everything we do. And so today, in this very short time, I'm very happy that the first few biologics and biosimilars that we have you know, launched in global markets have already benefited two million patients. And in the next two, three years, we want to benefit five million patients with all these drugs. I think you have just heard that there was this alarming WHO statistics that came out last week that 10% of Indians are going to be affected with cancer at some stage of their life. That's scary. And in that, they're also saying that one in five deaths due to any disease will be due to cancer. But that is a huge challenge we have to overcome. I personally believe it's not just about, you know, developing drugs cheaply. It's about preventive early diagnosis. So I also believe that there's a huge opportunity for developing new di diagnostics that can detect the disease earlier on. Because the, early you, uh, the earlier you catch these kind of diseases, the cheaper it is to cost and the better is the outcome. So I really want you to also focus on diagnostics, apart from just drugs. So I think this is, we are getting into a very, very serious uh, situation when it comes to these kind of uh, drugs and diseases. So now, let me give you some nice uplifting opportunity data. Global, the global biosimilars market by 2025 is estimated to be $69 billion. And it is growing at a very high, uh, you know, uh, rate of growth. It's growing at over 25% per annum. So this is the fastest growing segment, the largest segment for anyone to really address and approach. And what is also happening is that the, uh, you know, the share of the recombinant DNA sector in 2018 was greater than 80%. And the MAB segment alone is 30% uh, of this, and it's growing. So I think you're seeing that this particular biologic sector, this particular uh, recombinant DNA sector, is just growing at the fastest possible growth rate. So when you look at the market value 
of uh, you know the the biologics you can see that in the us it is 655 uh, million dollars already the kegar is again almost approaching 40 percent in india the kegar is also in that 26 percent range for biosimilars so i think biosimilars is going to be a very exciting opportunity you know it's still not even a billion dollars in the us as per this data but it's two years old i can tell you in 2019 2020 it's easily going to cross a billion dollars and more so you've seen that the opportunity is huge it's 69 billion so you can see the rate of growth that is forecast for this particular segment now finally coming to india i think we are really poised to be a global leader if we do everything right it's about the availability of talent for sure and that's where institutes like yours have to play a very important role apart from all the other institutes like the iits the the other scientific institutions in our country the universities the the colleges i think we have to start right from the beginning i'm very happy that we ourselves through our philanthropy and through our csr we started the biocon academy where we are actually developing uh, you know not enough students but at least we are doing about uh, 200 students a year we are teaching them the whole as aspect of bio techno bio processing this whole area of uh, how do we plan strategize and get this regulatory and uh, development skills that are required to make us lead uh, lead in this area we have to increase investments and therefore i think these investments must come both from the private sector and from the government policy is going to be at the heart of us being successful and i know that many of our organizations are working very closely with the regulators with the niti aayog to see and with of course dbt to see how we come up with better and better policies that address some of these opportunities and we must position ourselves globally as a front runner as a leader and all this is going to mean that we participate at all these international symposia or make sure that we all we speak at these international symposia with confidence and with that uh, message with a strong message that india is leading the way in biosimilars i think those are some of the strong uh, activities and messages that we have to do so with that i'd like to again wish you a very successful conference i just saw all the panel discussions you're having very interesting very relevant but i think this is a time we have to be serious i'm glad you're going to give a white paper to the government because i find that conferences without some outcome and commitment to a white paper is meaningless i think this is a serious symposium we are all here to put India on the map in terms of leading in biosimilars for the world. Thank you so much. I just want to end by saying this is perhaps the best make in India for the world opportunity.